This is Books of Titans, the podcast dedicated to the influences of influencers. The books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectuals, scientists, and others. We'll talk about what makes these books such classics and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about what makes them so important and influential. Hello, this is Eric Rostad coming to you right outside of Nashville, Tennessee. Today I'm going to cover Destiny Disrupted by Tamim Ansari, A History of the World Through Islamic Eyes. This is book 15 of 52 for my 2020 reading list. Each year, I try to read at least one book about the Middle East. And for last year, I I asked a question on Instagram. I said, what what book should I read about the Middle East? And this one was suggested to me. And it intrigued me right away, just that tagline of a history of the world through Islamic eyes. I read War and Peace in 2018 as part of this reading project. And one thing that stuck out to me in that epic novel is just the consideration of the Napoleonic Wars from the Russian point of view. I mean, first off, they're not called the Napoleonic Wars from Rush on the Russian side of things. And what uh, what happens in that book is is you see the war from so many different vantage points. Like one chapter, you're you're kind of understanding it from Napoleon's point of view, and then the next pe- uh, chapter from a, a Russian general, and then and then maybe a, a Russian common soldier. And so you're just getting all these different viewpoints and, and different narratives going on of, of that war. And it got me thinking, what, what in my education and in my way of thinking is viewed from a singular viewpoint? So, and what about my view of the Middle East? Uh, And what if I could see it from the eyes of someone from that region, as opposed to seeing it as a Westerner? So this was the perfect book for me. And and, and after reading it, it it, it really was the perfect book. It it was published in 2009, and I wish I would have read it then, because I've read so many other books about the Middle East between 2009 and, and now, and... Most of those were were just about a, a small snippet of of time or about a particular country uh, event event surrounding this main event, but this was the broad overview of Middle East history. So this this was like the primer on Middle East or Middle East one hundred and one, if if you uh, if you want to call it that. Uh, it tied all the different parts together, and so now. Going forward, if I read a book about the Middle East, I'll have a much better idea on the context of what I'm reading. So I, w- I want to read a little section from the the introduction that uh, that describes a little more of of th- uh, these ideas and then and then how this book is put together. So here we go. Throughout much of history, the West and the core of what is now the Islamic world have been like two separate universes, each preoccupied with its own internal affairs, each assuming itself to be the center of human history, each living out a different narrative, until the late 17th century when the two narratives began to intersect. At that point, one or the other had to give way because the two narratives were cross-currents to each other. The West being more powerful, its current prevailed and churned the other one under. But the superseded history never really ended. It kept on flowing beneath the surface like a riptide, and it is flowing down there still. When you chart the hot spots of the world, Kashmir, Iraq, Chechnya, the Balkans, Israel, and Palestine, Iraq, you're staking out the borders of some entity that has vanished from the maps but still thrashes and flails in its effort not to die. This is the story I tell in the pages that follow, and I emphasize story. Destiny Disrupted is neither a textbook nor a scholarly thesis. It's more like what I'd tell you if we met in a coffee house and you said, what's all this about a parallel world history? The argument I can I, I make can be found in numerous books now on the shelves of university libraries. Read it there if you don't want, mind academic language and footnotes. Read it here if you want the story arc. Uh, end quote. So the author, Tamim Ansari, is an Afghan-American, and so he's straddled both cultures. He was born in Afghanistan and has lived in the United States for for many years as well. Most history books are very stuffy, and this one is the opposite. This is not stuffy at all. And as he mentioned in that intro I just read, it is is more of that narrative, that, that story arc. It has that feel to it. It was almost too loose at times, uh, but it did make for an enjoyable and an an enlightening book. 
So I'm going to divide this episode into three segments. The first is going to be uh, what is Islam and what are Islamic eyes? So obviously not going into the history of Islam here, but what is Islam and what are Islamic eyes as described in, in this book? So where is he coming from with that tagline, a history of the world through Islamic eyes? What does that mean? What are you going to get out of, out of this book? Second segment is, uh, I'm just going to highlight a few things that I learned, things that, that stuck out to me that I didn't know before reading this book. And then in segment three, I'm going to go into narrative and how different narratives impact how we, how we view things like like history, for example. Uh, and so this, this book offers the narrative from the Islamic point of view. But you know, you know how is that different from the Western point of view? And, and what does that mean uh, in, in other cases? And also, how does that tie in with other books that I've read for this project? So what is the author talking about when he's speaking about looking at history through Islamic eyes? Well, here's what he says of, is it, of Islam in, in the, uh, the afterword of the book. So this is the second to last page, but I thought this was a good, um, good summary. It is problematically misleading to think of Islam as one item in a class whose other items are Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc., not inaccurate, of course. Islam is a religion. Like those others, a distinct set of beliefs and practices related to ethics, morals, God, the cosmos, and morality. But Islam might just as validly be considered as one item in a class whose other items include communism, parliamentary democracy, fascism, and the like, because Islam is a social project, like those others, an idea for how politics and the economy ought to be managed, a complete system of civil, civil and criminal law. Then again, Islam can quite validly be seen as one item in a class whose other items include Chinese civilization, Indian civilization, Western civilization, and so on, because there is a universe of cultural artifacts from art to philosophy to architecture to handicrafts to virtually every other realm of human cultural endeavor that could proper, properly be called Islamic. Or, as I've tried to demonstrate, Islam can be seen as one world history among many that are unfolding simultaneously, each in some way incorporating all the others. Considered in this light, Islam is a vast narrative moving through time. End quote. I, I, I thought that was a great, uh, a great summary, because it, what he's talking about with Islam is, yes, he, he talks about religion, when he talks about Islam, yes, he, he's also talking about uh, the social project of it, the, the fact that it's more of a, of a, a community and, and a government and, and incorporating that along with the religion. But then it's also an entire civilization. And, and in fact, he calls it the, the Middle World. He doesn't call it the Middle East because the Middle East assumes there's a West. And, uh, and just to... to to kind of throw you off from, from considering it from a Western point of view, he just calls it the middle world because for many centuries it was, it, it was, it was the middle of the world. It was the center of things. Uh, and, and he contrasts it, the middle world a lot with, with Rome. So Rome was kind of the center of, of the other world. And then, uh, the middle, the middle world, uh, was a, com a completely different thing. So the other thing he's talking about when he, when he talks about through Islamic eyes are, from countries where there is a Muslim majority. So this book really kicks off in 600, uh, what in the West we would call AD uh, or the Common Era. Uh, so 600 and the start of Islam. And then, and then it goes from there. Uh, some of the big ideas in this book are this idea in, in, in Islam, especially at the beginning where there was a realm of peace and then there was a realm of war. And the realm of peace was where Islam was. And, and they viewed the, the realm of war outside of that area. And so uh, the, the start of Islam, the, uh, they're winning all these battles against, against other, other groups of people. And there were m miraculous battles, you know, uh, few people against many, and, and they, would, they would win. And that kind of became part of the part of the, the narrative that uh, within their borders was peace. But if you went outside, that's where you're going to fight war. And that's where you're gonna, going to increase. Uh, but, but within the realm itself, that was peace. 
And so when, when that began to shift, when, when, um, when groups outside of, of that, whether it was the Mongols or later on uh, European powers, when they came in and started defeating uh, it, it, these areas of, of Islamic rule, it, it begged this question, how, how can we have lost? We, uh, what does this do to the, the religion part of Islam? Uh, what does this do to our, our, our theology? Uh, how, do, how do we make sense of all this if, if that was such an important part of the beginning? So that, that shows up a lot in this book, especially as uh, Western powers increase and there's, there's more uh, interaction and conflict. Uh, how, how does all that make, make sense? And, and it's interesting, too, that a lot of these clashes, they, they, the, the point of the clash is the in in where they overlap where these two areas overlap the east and west where they connect and that happens to be in in israel lebanon syria jordan that that area and that you know we still see that to this day and uh, towards the end of the book he gets into the creation of of um the modern state of israel and uh there's one paragraph that just that just sticks sticks out in just the the chaos of that whole thing and, and really kind of viewing it from more from the, the middle world, the, the Islamic point of view. And so here, here's a, the paragraph and it starts with this to recap. And it's worth a recap. Britain essentially promised the same territory to the Hashemites, the Saudis and the Zionists of Europe territory actually inhabited by still another Arab people with rapidly developing nationalist aspirations of their own, while in fact Britain and France had already secretly agreed to carve up the whole promised territory between themselves. Despite the many quibbles, qualifiers, and disclaimers offered over the years about who agreed to what and what was promised to whom, that's the gist of the situation, and it guaranteed an explosion in the future. I learned a lot in this book, and like I said before, it really helped to tie a lot of pieces together of either things I'd, I'd learned or read about, uh, but just never could really tie the whole thing together. So in this segment, I just want to highlight some of the the things that really stuck out to me, and and some of our some of them are embarrassing. I mean, just things I should have known, but um, but yeah, here are some things, and you might find these interesting. So the first is that the stories of Adam, Abraham. A lot of the stories in, in Genesis of of uh, of the Bible, when, when the the book one of my reading list this year, those were Arab stories. So throughout the Arab world, these stories would have been known. And I don't, I don't know that I ever considered you know where the boundaries of that would have been way back in in time. But I guess I just would have assumed that uh, that those stories would have been more localized, maybe to, closer to to. Israel, uh, but that these were these stories were well known throughout the Arab world. That that was uh, something that uh, I didn't know and, and was interesting. Uh, another thing: Muslims first performed their prayers facing Jerusalem before it changed to facing Mecca, where where it is to this day. So uh, five times a day they face Mecca to to pray. But at, uh, at the very 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 beginning, they performed those prayers facing Jerusalem. Uh, 90% of Muslims are Sunni Muslims. And, and I knew that, but I, I would always have a hard time remembering what countries had majorities of each type of Muslims, whether it was Sunni or, or Shiite. And no matter how many books I read on it or maps I'd look, I'd, I just, I would always have a hard time remembering. And, um, but this book really helped me to, to understand by, by starting from the beginning and, and kind of seeing where the different branches went. So for example, Iran is a Shiite majority country, and Iran back in time was was Persia. So Persians were Indo-Europeans, whereas Arabs were Semitic people. And so there there was always there was there was a natural division amongst those groups already. And so uh, Arabs took to to Sunni, and uh, the Persians they kind of wanted to maintain their their separation, and so they clung to to Shiite. Islam, and there, there's still that distinction today. So, so uh, Iran is still a majority Shiite country. Um, Iraq is a majority 
Shiite country. Uh, the population there is, is majority Shiite. But when Saddam was in power, he was part of the Bath- Bathists who were Sunnis. And so you had Sunnis ruling a majority Shiite population. And so you just kind of, you start to see how these, these, these groups spread out and, and, and it helps make sense of a lot of what you read about. And so just, I guess, just seeing it from that point of view, as opposed to trying to, to look at it and, and try to remember uh, what groups lived where, uh, but to see it from the other side, that, that really helped. And again, something I'm just kind of embarrassed that I don't know, uh, it's, it's something I should know, but, um, but this, this book helped me to, to, to know that better. Uh, one thing he highlights, the author highlights in this book is that Islam never had what in, in Christianity had the, the Protestant Reformation. There, there was never really that in, is in Islam. And one of the big ideas with with Islam and one of the founding things was that it it was about a community. And so with the Protestant Reformation, that was really a, a, a lot of it with the individual. The individual could could approach God directly and, and didn't that didn't need to be, need to be through an inter, intermediary. But Islam never had that Protestant Reformation, and and he goes into what that means and and how. That uh, led to clashes later on uh, with with European countries and powers, uh, but that was that was really interesting and, and just something I'd never never considered. And then there there are a lot of parts towards the end, just about the the more modern carving up of the Middle East and, and what we know of now as as the different countries. Uh, and, and when you look at a map now, I mean you see these straight lines and. Straight lines should just tell you that that somebody is working from a map to to create that because a, a, a natural boundary between two countries is not it's not just going to be a straight line from one area to another. I, it might follow a, uh, a natural uh, river or or mountains or something, but but for for you to see straight lines, you you know something's up and and to read about how that was carved up uh, by by a lot of the European powers is just. It's it's amazing, and then t- just to see how many problems that caused is is, uh, is is pretty astounding as well. So those were some of the things that that stuck out to me. Things I learned. This book is full of of those types of things, though. And and even if you know bits and pieces of of Middle Eastern history, this this one really helps to to tie all those things together. Now on to segment three. This is where I highlight my one thing, my one key takeaway from each book that I read. And I found that uh, if, I, if I try to remember a bunch of things from a book, I, I'll end up not remembering any of those things. But if I just try to remember one thing, I will remember that one thing, but then I, it, it will also help me to remember other things from, from the book. So that's the idea behind this segment. And my one thing from this book is, is just this idea of narrative and how we each have a narrative of how things work in our mind. And that could be from, from how the world works. And then, you know, each, each thing we come across, each news story has got to fill with, uh, fill within that filter, within that narrative. Uh, but also just grand overviews of, of history, how we view the world. Uh, I, I think back to the book Generations that was part of my 2017 reading list. And in, in that book, there are there, it's, it starts with presenting two different views of history, and one is the linear linear view. Things are, are progressing along this, this specific path, and that's contrasted with the cyclical view of history repeating itself. And similar similar things to in, in this book in the sense that the West in, in the West there's kind of a general way of, of viewing history, and then in the East, in in the middle world, as as the author calls it here, there's a different view. So I want to read some quotes uh, that happen both in the in the introduction and in the afterward that uh, go into this idea of narrative a little more. So we'll start um, start here in the in the introduction. I came to perceive that unlike the history of France or Malta or South America, the history of the Islamic lands over there was not a subset of some single world history shared by all. It was more like a whole alternate history, world history unto itself. 
In the United States, the further presumption holds the world history leads to the birth of its founding ideals of liberty and equality and to its resultant rise as a superpower leading the planet into the future. This premise establishes a direction for history and places the endpoint somewhere down the road we're traveling now. It renders us vulnerable to the supposition that all people are moving in the same direction, though some are not quite as far along, either because they started late or because they're moving more slowly, for which we call these nations developing countries. And now I'm going to go to the end of the book, and, and uh, this is a few paragraphs, but but um, stick with me because this is, this is really this is really interesting. From the other side, however, the moral and military campaigns of recent times look like the long familiar program to enfeeble Muslims in their own countries. Western customs, legal systems, and democracy look like a project to atomize society down to the level of individual economic units, making autonomous decisions based on rational self-interest. Ultimately, it, it seems this would pit every man, woman, and child against every other in a competition of all against all for material goods. What looks from one side like a campaign to secure greater rights for citizens irrespective of gender looks from the other side like powerful strangers inserting themselves into the private affairs of families and undercutting people's ability to maintain their communal selves as familial and tribal networks. In short, what looks from one side like empowering each individual looks from the other side like disempowering whole communities. I'm going to read that one more time. What looks like from one side like empowering each individual looks from the other side like disempowering whole communities. The conflict racking racking the modern world is not, I think, best understood as a clash of civilizations, if that proposition means we're different so we must fight until there's only one of us left. It's better understood as the friction generated by two mismatched world histories intersecting. Muslims were a crowd of people going somewhere. Europeans and their offshoots were a crowd of people going somewhere. When the two crowds crossed paths, much bumping and crashing resulted, and the crashing is still going on. End quote. That gives an idea of, of the, the differing narratives that, uh, that, are, that are shown, and this, this book takes you through the narrative through Islamic eyes. Uh, if you're reading this from the United States or, or from the, from Europe or, or, or somewhere from the West, you, you've probably heard of, of history from a different point of view. So hearing it from this, it, it, it opens up a new narrative and, and it's a, it's a powerful concept. And it's one that this idea of narrative, it's one that keeps popping up all over the place for this reading project. So on one hand, uh, you have a book like building a story brand where Donald Miller tells you how to invite your customer into your bigger in, into a bigger narrative. And so it's not necessarily your company's narrative, but you're you're trying to get your customer to to join into a bigger narrative because your your customer wants your your customer wants that. Uh, and, and so if you as a company can learn how to communicate in that way, you'll have better results. So that that's one way with it. Uh, a, a, another book from this year, The Sacred Romance, and that's talking about how your life fits in with this narrative that's found in the Gospels and how it all ties in with the story of Jesus Christ. Then you have these other grand narratives called myths that cross cultures. And so in Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faceless, you you see these different myths and how they're 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 similar across cultures and and how these narratives allow cultures to, to understand themselves, uh, maybe understand where they came from. So it's, it's powerful, this idea of, of narratives. And I've, I've really been thinking a lot about it lately. Um, with, with all the different news going on, it, it's, it's interesting to just to go to different news outlets and see how they're covering a particular story. And you really get to see how each organization is is operating with a specific narrative. And it's the narrative that their audience uh, goes for. It's the narrative that, that their audience expects to hear. And so any story goes through that narrative. And you could switch stations and, and view the same story and, and, and wonder, am I even listening to the same thing here because the assumptions, the way 
each of the characters in the story are presented are so vastly different. And that's because they have to fit into this narrative. And so, especially if it's a 24-hour news cycle, each there's so much that, that you've got to talk about that there needs to be some sort of a, a standard going forward. And that standard is a narrative. And you expect when you go to that station, un, uh, unfortunately, I think, you, you expect it to fit within that, that narrative. So the, the idea here, we're, we're all working off of a narrative. And to understand where someone's coming from, you, 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 you need to understand their narrative. And this is a book that will help you do that in, in the sense of understanding history from, from Islamic eyes. And what I continually found myself doing was just saying, ah, oh, no, okay, that, that makes sense. It, it was like things were, were clicking. And I know going forward, just even reading news stories and where in the past I, I may have been, you know, how, how in the world would people from that region of the world, why, why would they think of things in that way? Why are they thinking of, of th- this particular story in a certain way? But now that helps to make sense. Another recent book in the in the book I covered in the the previous podcast, Between the World and Me, by Ta-Nehisi Coates, that's that is a different narrative than the one I know. He it's a, a a black father writing a letter to his son of what he will experience, the racism he will experience in his life. That's why that book was so, so powerful. It it provided another narrative, one that I don't know, but to read that narrative helps helps me under understand a little bit more. So I, I to recap, this is your Middle East 101 book. If you are are ignorant on about the Middle East like like I am, th- I, I, I suggest this book before you read any others. I've read some other great ones, but this one will provide the necessary context for anything you read going forward. Uh, it's it's a fun book in the sense of it it, it, it does read more like a story as opposed to like a, a textbook and it provides that narrative behind the history so uh, this was this is a good place to start if you are wanting to know more about the Middle East all right that's gonna do it for this episode thank you for listening I'd love to hear from you you can email me at Eric at booksoftitans.com. That's Eric with a K, so E-R-I-K, at booksoftitans.com. You can also send me a letter. Just go to the Books of Titans website and go to the contact page, and, and my address is there. I received a written letter a month ago, and that was that was so fantastic. Somebody was, was actually using that as a way to kind of help them remember what they learned in the books they've been reading. And, and it was a delight for me to read that. So I'd love to, to receive a letter from you as well and, and to hear about what you're reading, maybe um, hear your thoughts on, on this episode or, or another episode on, on maybe something you learned or uh, uh, maybe even another book that, that you read on, on these topics that, um, that helped you. You can follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter. And the, the website is also stock full of resources to help you find the best books and to create your own reading list. I'll be back next week discussing another book from my 2020 reading list. And until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out.